Welcome to Belly Dance Alchemy, a captivating blend of the best elements of career and professional development and the magic of belly dance. I'm your host, Kelly Nottingham. Ready to make your day job sparkle and your dance life grow in new and inspiring ways? Well, let's see what we can brew up. And now for part two of my interview with Kristen Chestnut on finding our value outside of work. Enjoy! Like we were talking about, I think one of the other things that we just really need to get better about as a society and as individuals is understanding that all of these different jobs have value and stop trying to place different levels of value on those jobs. Yes. Like yes. we need to get out of this mindset of like, you're just a janitor or you're just entry level. You're just a data analyst versus like, oh, you're a senior manager. Oh, you're a VP. Society can't run without people who work in the restaurant industry, in the hotel industry, who are janitors, who are teachers, society, truck drivers, truck drivers. Yes. We saw this during COVID, like everything shut down because we didn't have like people to help with the supply chain and people to build stuff at factories that we needed. Yes. Society needs all of these other jobs. They have amazing value that we could not live without. And so we need to stop looking down on them or being like, okay, it's fine for now, but you need to aspire to something greater that I don't understand that mindset. I know a lot of people who have that mindset. I personally don't understand it. I, I personally, I could never be a barista, understand all the different recipes for, I can barely make my coffee at home and have it taste good. (laughs) My Nespresso does the majority of my work for mm-hmm, me. Mm-hmm. And even then it's still not the same as somebody yeah. who knows how to make good quality espresso and steams milk. So we just, I don't know why I'm stuck on the idea of coffee, but it, we just caffeine. need to value. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, I, <laughs> maybe I didn't have enough. Um, we just need to value them more because they all yeah. have so much more value and require and deserve so much more recognition than we have given them in the past that we give them now. Um, And I think that's a huge part of the conversation that needs to happen. I completely agree. It's, it's one thing, my sister and I have talked about this quite a bit that we're really grateful to our mom for giving us that growing up and, and making sure that we understood that you treat people with respect, no matter what they do for a living, no matter who they are. And I've seen it come out where I didn't really think about it until I saw other people not doing it. Um, I remember, okay, this is like way flashback in the past. My job in college, I was a work study student in college and my job was sitting in the basement of the library and I opened the periodicals, the international periodicals and sorted them for them to go up on the shelves. And the maintenance crew for the for campus would often come through there because they kept a lot of their supplies in the basement so I knew them really well like I would literally see them every day we would stop and chat and talk and super nice super nice people and it didn't really even occur to me to to think anything about having a, like a, a relationship with them until I was on campus one day and I went to a fairly well-known, highly respected school that was um, sometimes called the plantation because we had a lot of very wealthy white kids on campus. Um, I was not one of those wealthy kids on campus, Um, but we were in a predominantly black community, um, the university was. And so a lot of the the staff on campus were, were black. And so I was walking across campus one day and I saw these guys on campus and I waved at them. And they looked at each other and then looked at me and kind of sheepishly waved back. And so I walked over there and I was like, hey, how you guys doing? And they they were surprised that I spoke to them. And it was heartbreaking to me because they said people don't talk to us in public. I was horrified. I was I was horrified. And it it made me very grateful to be raised with the idea that you respect people no matter what they do. But even, even with that being said, growing up, going to college, going to graduate school, being told that like certain jobs were for, for me, 
other jobs, you don't need to be doing that stuff. That's too simple. That's too basic for you. That's too low on the, you know, on the ladder for you. You don't need to be worrying about that kind of stuff. That does seep in. It really does seep in over time and until you start realizing that you're having those, those sorts of thoughts when something like COVID happens and you, you look around and realize that like basic stuff is not being handled. <laughs> Because those of us in office jobs are like, I am completely helpless to do anything <laughs> with this situation. Yeah. Like, I can't, I can't fix anything. I can't fix plumbing issues. I can't do, I, I can't do anything for myself because I'm so used to these other people doing all this stuff for me and me putting myself on a pedestal that's like, well, I don't need to worry about that because I have people that do that for me. So yeah. it, it is, it is so detrimental. I, you're absolutely right. To the way that we view work, to the way that we view value of human beings. Um, and it's it takes kind of that constant awareness, I think, when we're when we're looking around and we see people who are doing jobs that that we wouldn't necessarily want to do and asking ourselves questions around why. Why would we not want to do that? What is it about that job that, you know, like, I don't feel like that's something I should be doing. And ooh, 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 when you catch that, where is that coming from? Yeah, it's another um, form of unconscious bias that a lot exactly. of people didn't even realize that they had a bias against certain jobs. Exactly. Until exactly like you're saying, I mean, look at all the strikes that are going on right now. I mean, yes. this whole idea of nobody wants to work anymore. No, nobody wants to work for a job that doesn't value them, that doesn't yeah. allow them to live. I mean, just to be able to afford basic necessities, to basic be able to literally stay alive, yes. you're not even going to give them that, but yeah. you demand everything and more from them. Yeah. I mean. Often backbreaking just, labor too. Yeah. Like literally so much, physical struggling labor to so do much these jobs. extra time. Like yeah. teachers, a lot of them have contracted hours, but they're expected to work more than that despite not getting paid for it and deal with parents. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I can more power to them. For, yeah. <laughs> I, again, no, I no, no. do that. I <laughs> no. considered being a teacher for a while and I was like, it's not the kids. It's the parents. It's the parents. Yeah. I thought about it for about seven seconds one time. And I was like, yeah. I don't think I, I don't have the energy level to do that. Yeah. And now of course it's, it's the administration and all that kind of stuff that's going into it as well. But again, it's, it just goes back to that it's not that we don't want to work. People are happy to do the work when they are valued mm -hmm. equitably for doing the work that they put in. Mm -hmm. And I mean, back to the unconscious bias thing as well. We haven't even gotten to have a conversation around like privilege and all the kind of systemic things that impact different groups of people, different right. races and genders and the privileges that some people have, including me as a, a white presenting woman, Again, kind of going back to my earlier comment about being privileged to be comfortable with where I am, but that's right. because I had a lot of privilege growing up and it kind of goes back to why so many different jobs also are valued, should be more valued is because not everybody has access to move into these other areas mm -hmm. that we quote, like are just quote unquote, so much better than other jobs, but we're not going to open up opportunities for everybody to then be able to access those jobs. Yeah. Yes. Like that's not yeah. fair. Anyways. No. Again, not. another tangent for another we're just, conversation. We're just gonna have to book more time with you, dear. <laughs> yeah. And talk to you again, which yeah. is awesome. Um, so you had some book recommendations for our listeners. So what were your book recommendations? Yes. Yeah. So Laziness Does Not Exist by Devin Price, and then Burnout by Dr. Amelia Nagoski and Dr. Emily Nagoski. And that one I think I made a comment about it dealing with the seven types of rest, but that book, it deals with the stress cycle, but it's been in conversation with the seven types of, of rest that have kind of gone in to the same conversation. So that's actually a separate book, but um, both, both very important books. And then the seven types of rest, I do highly, it's not the name of the book, but if you just Google seven types of rest and look into, you know, you need mental rest, you need sleep, you need creative rest, all different kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And that kind of also helps to contribute to burnout. So yeah. Yeah, because resting is not resting if you're just switching from 
one set of job responsibilities to side hustle job responsibilities or yeah managing your home yeah feeding all 48 of the animals in my house um you know that's still not resting yeah 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 no that's excellent so thank you i wanted to wrap up with uh just a couple of thoughts about how we you and i and all of our listeners can continue to try to find our value and our identity outside of work uh, so a couple of thoughts that i've been personally working with lately are being curious about what interests me and following those things without the expectation that i need to be amazingly good at them that is tough because yeah, i'm a absolutely. perfectionist and so it's like I want to try some new hobby and I'm like, oh, I'll try this new hobby and maybe I can make money at it and maybe I can turn it into this whole big thing and maybe I can become like an Emmy award winning, whatever, whatever. Um, instead of just saying like, I might be horrible and that's awesome yeah. <laughs> to be horrible at something. <laughs> um, and just, just to allow that curiosity to come out as something that is valuable within ourselves. And with that same idea is catching those judgment thoughts of when I'm not doing enough or I don't feel like I'm I'm working fast enough or I didn't get this done today or that the judgment thoughts that go with transferring my to-do list and you've seen my to-do list, they're ridiculous, um, transferring the to-do list onto the next day's to-do list and then mm -hmm. being like hateful with myself for not getting it all done even though no human being on the planet could get all of that done. Yeah. Um, but catching those judgment thoughts whenever they're happening to say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm, I'm doing enough. I am enough that I am enough without even doing. I am enough. So those are things I've been working with. I don't know if you have any tips or ideas that you would like to share with everybody on finding value and identity outside of work. Yeah, I think the biggest tip I would offer is to first just kind of reflect on what you really want, what brings you joy. Because again, kind of like we were talking about earlier, for some people that will be work, maybe they are working um, in a nonprofit that they're really passionate about, or maybe they're working in government and pushing policies that they truly believe in, or maybe they're an instructional designer and they love it. And that yeah. is absolutely where they find the value in their life. And that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But also just be okay with the fact that work, whatever it is, doesn't have to be what your value is. Find, figure out what find, what brings you joy and make time for it. So again, like I mentioned, for me, I fell in love with reading. And so I always make tons of time for it. I absolutely get heat from it. <laughs> you know, visiting my family, I'll always have a book with me. Um, sometimes I prioritize staying in to read a book because that's just really what I want to do as opposed to going out. And that's okay. And I'm the same as you, like I am also a perfectionist. And so I I'll try like watercolor painting. I'm like, I can do this. This will be my new creative outlet. And yeah, I absolutely have in the past <laughs> had a terrible, um, record of being like, I'm not immediately good at this, which mm -hmm. who is, who's immediately good at something the first time they try it. Nobody. <laughs> Like, nobody and just finding the joy in trying new things mm -hmm. and being okay like you said with not immediately being good at it and also like you mentioned not commodifying it because not everything has to produce monetary value yeah <laughs> it, it can bring joy and that is value to my yes. life yes and so I think that's kind of the first thing is evaluating what brings you joy is it work great then that's what you can focus on is it traveling. Fantastic. How can you make that happen more with whatever means you have? Is it reading? Is it painting? Is it just, I want to try every single craft possible, figure out what it is and figure out how you can make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think it's just the other thing, like I mentioned, is setting boundaries. And yeah. I know, I know that it's incredibly hard because again, I'm still not perfect at it in any way, shape or form, but turning off your work phone or not even having work on your phone in any shape or form, if you can avoid it, if you're able to leave it off of your devices, if, if you prefer to have a flexible schedule, fantastic. If you want to work a couple of hours, do something else, work a couple more hours, especially if you work remotely, if that's a possibility, again, fantastic. If that's what works for you, you don't have to force yourself to stick to a schedule, 
but just figuring out what those boundaries are and setting them and doing your best to stick to them to make sure that you have time for what does bring you joy. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you're saying this too, because as you were just saying that, it reminded me of how difficult it can be sometimes to even remember what brings us joy because we we yeah. get so used to not even looking for it anymore mm-hmm. and expecting it to be something that costs money or expecting it to be something that's complicated. I love to just, I love to take a walk and in my neighborhood. And so sometimes it's like, I just, and it's, it's Houston, it's hot. I'll take my little umbrella (laughs) and I'll go and walk um, just in the middle of the day when I'm feeling that stress and that anxiety. And it's like, sometimes it's worth more to me mentally and emotionally and physically to go take a walk instead of even eating lunch. Like I, I don't even want to eat lunch sometimes when I've been able to sort of fill myself up with some sunshine and the little lizards that are running across the yard and and that kind of thing. So, uh, but it's very easy to tune that out. And so looking for those moments of, of joy and looking for those moments when the stress is starting to, to really spike, that's usually when there's a boundary being broken are yeah. being pushed against. So, yeah. and I think yeah. it's important too to, to consider the fact that like, not everybody has the ability to just quit. Right. I hear that a lot oh, right yeah. now from like oh, yeah. career coaches and the people like, I'll help you break into tech so that you can make six figures. And it's not possible for everybody to right. just quit a job or people who right. are like, oh, I would never work at a job that just drains me or makes me cry that's not a possibility. Sometimes for you don't have the choice. Yeah. You don't have a choice Yeah, for whatever reason, you know, yeah. either again, like maybe it's just, you've been trying to apply and you, you can't get anything else, or maybe you, you can't just up and quit without other possibilities. Mm-hmm. And so again, I think that's where that boundaries piece comes in that again, if it's possible, figure out what boundaries you can set. Yes. Cause again, some jobs yes. will absolutely push those. Mm-hmm. And in some jobs, you can't set the kinds of boundaries you want, but figure out where you can set a boundary mm-hmm. and try to stick to them and find ways that help you, that bring you joy, that help you de-stress so that you can essentially like survive. Unfortunately, I think is the yeah. way to put it in that job. Yeah. Um, and hopefully eventually find something else, but also kind of, again, kind of addressing that narrative around like, just quit. It's just not a possibility. For it's everybody. not possible. It's not possible, but there is the possibility, you know, that we, we can still try to find that sense of self and that sense of identity outside of our work, which yeah. I know in situations where I've been in, where I haven't been able to quit and I've been in a really bad situation at work, um, where I was stuck, I was stuck giving myself that space of saying, I am not what I do. Yeah. I am not, this, this is literally a means to an end for me. This is, I do this so I can buy groceries and so I can, you know, pay to put gas in my car so I can get to my job. Yeah. Um, but finding that larger purpose in my life, which is helping others mm-hmm. that helped me to be able to get through those periods until some time and opportunity opened up that I was able to then make a, a different choice with yeah. work. I think I told you, you know, at one point in one of my jobs, I was just, I was so stressed and miserable and the company, a lot of companies did this, but the company was pushing out this narrative, just take care of yourself, make yourself a healthy meal. Everything's going to be fine while also piling on extreme amounts of work and short deadlines to every employee. I was not the only one feeling that way. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to take the time for myself and I'm going to make myself a healthy breakfast this morning. So I got all the ingredients. I was like, I'm going to cook a breakfast hash. I had an incredibly stressful meeting and then went to go make my breakfast with tears streaming down my face. Mm. And it was just such an eye-opening moment for me that I was like, here I am trying to take care of myself by making a breakfast while bawling my eyes out. (laughs) this is not healthy. And I think that was one of the points where I was like, I need to set better boundaries. Cause part of it was that I wasn't setting boundaries. And like you mentioned, I started to set some and it did help certainly did not fix the situation. Everything wasn't all of a sudden peachy and rosy, Mm -hmm. 
Um, but setting the boundaries did help at least a little bit until I was able to, to find a different situation. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that's all we can do, you know, until we can, you know, until we all win the lottery somehow magically. <laughs> Every single person um, will be great. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, again, Jeff Bezos, if you would like to share some of your money <laughs> and Elon Musk there, that too. Yes. So, yeah. So, you know, hopefully this conversation has been um, been helpful for some folks who may be dealing with some of this right now. Some people that are that are trying to understand this whole concept of quiet quitting. We talked about that a little bit and trying to understand what that can actually look like in a healthy way instead of in an unhealthy way uh, and figuring out, you know, how do we identify ourselves? How do we associate ourselves and our sense of self, our sense of value, our sense of worthiness with the work that we do and how can we instead look at something a little more um, self-focused and internal and use work as that outlet for part of our um, purpose instead of the source of our purpose. Yeah, absolutely. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much um, for being here. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll have you back because you had a lot to say and we have a lot of conversations still waiting to be had. So, (laughs) so thank you everyone very much. And uh, thank you, Kristen, for all of your great book recommendations and until next time, everyone take care. Well, thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, please subscribe to this podcast and share the magic with your dance friends. If you want more, you can sign up for our mailing list at bellydancealchemy.com. Org, or you can email me your suggestions and feedback. I would love to hear from you at bellydancealchemypodcast at gmail.com. Bye.